Point of View Audio presents Part 6 of The Way It Has to Be, a novella written by Michael E. Hammond. The next day, Miss Wayworth and I took a little drive into the country, ready to carry out the plan that we had concocted. We parked at the end of a lonely dirt road, and from there, we walked through a field, approaching the woods from the opposite side of where Blair's house was. My plan was simple. I remember the day that Blair took the book, and I protested. He assured me that no one would miss the book, because there were several other copies, several other copies that we could look over without Blair even knowing. Miss Wayworth and I made our way through the woods and into that ravine. As we passed that fire pit where the goat skulls looked on at us, she shook her head, biting at her lip as if she didn't like any of it. She didn't like the skulls. She didn't like the quiet. She didn't like how it felt as if we were being watched. Truth be told, I didn't like it either. We didn't linger at all. We quickly made our way along the path to the cottage and down to the basement where we found the other seemingly discarded books. I thumbed through them, counting eleven books in total. Eleven books, I said aloud, to match the eleven cultists dancing around the fire? Just so, she agreed. She picked up one of the books and thumbed through it. This one's different, I said, pointing at the text. The one we took was written in some odd language. Can you read this? she asked, giving me a narrow-eyed glare. Yeah, I said simply. It says... Invoking the black flame. Interesting, she said. Why is that interesting? I asked. I already told you about the spell that could turn the fire black. Yes, you did, she said. But that is not what I find interesting. Her eyes narrowed only slightly in the dim, muted light of the basement. What I find interesting is that you can read this at all. It's written in some language I've never seen before. I glanced at the page again, suddenly realizing that she was right. The words were written in a, some kind of language, some kind of gibberish, yet despite this, I could actually read and understand what it meant. Do you have any idea what's going on? I asked, not sure I liked the idea. I have an inkling, she said as she closed the book. We need to get out of here. We need to take this book with us. Judging by the thick coat of dust, the cultists don't use them any more. So it's unlikely that they'll notice one in the stack missing. I was about to protest. Listen, love, she said with a warm smile. I'm not going to use the book if that's what you fear. We just need a safe place to look it over, which, if you haven't noticed, is not here. She handed me the book. Keep it yourself if you don't trust me. We'll burn the thing when we're done. We found ourselves back at the Nightingale. Leona Wayworth led me around the counter behind the beaded curtain to a small room, generally off-limits to the visitors of the shop. The walls were lined with heavy, luxurious-looking drapes of reds and golds, giving the whole room a harem-like tent feel. A small round table sat in the middle of the room, and there were several velvet upholstered chairs and a chaise lounge loaded with pillows. Decorative oil lamps lit the space, and a fragrant smoke of burning incense floated like a ghostly snake coiling around the room. "'Sit,' she said, as she directed me to one of the nearby chairs. "'I'll get us some tea.' Miss Wayworth disappeared behind one of the curtains at the back of the room, returning a few minutes later carrying a tray with an elegant-looking teapot, two cups, and various cookies. She set it down in the center of the round table and poured us both a cup of pale, red, steaming liquid. Sassafras, she smiled as she handed me the cup. You'll like it. We sat in silence as I sipped the tea, amazed by the sweet, woody taste. Something odd is at play here, she said, breaking the silence. And if we are to figure out your little problem, I'm going to need to understand what that book says. My theory is that by summoning this black flame, your mind was somehow altered to understand the language that is written here. She held a finger up to silence me before I could cut in. Worry not. I'm not going to summon the black flame. But there may be alternative ways to temporarily see with your eyes, as it were. How? I asked. A simple spell, she said. It will bind us for a short time. 
time enough for me to examine without subjecting myself to its dangers. Well, what do we do? I asked. Well, we are doing it now, she smiled. We drink tea, sassafras tea. The only thing missing is a drop of your blood and a drop of mine in each cup. It is the blood that binds us. I reluctantly agreed. I was really starting to question stepping my foot into this world of magic. I pricked my finger with a silver knife she had on her table and let a drop of my blood splash into each cup, and she did the same. We sat sipping our sassafras blood tea and enjoying small talk, as if it were all completely normal. The black book was open on the table before us. Now and again she'd look down from our conversation, waiting for the book to make sense. After a bit of time, Miss Wayworth took another sip of her tea before setting her cup down on the saucer with a clink. A smile formed on her full red lips. It's beginning to work, she said as she picked up the book. The words are beginning to make sense. Have some more tea if you wish. I'll let you know when I've found something. Miss Wayworth thumbed through the pages of the black book, her eyes intently scanning the text. Now and again she would lick a finger before turning the page, her brow twisting as if trying to make sense of the different parts. I simply sat there sipping my tea, trying my best to relax giving the circumstances of the situation. As I sat, taking in the room, the clouds of scented smoke, this, this strange spell bound by blood tea, Miss Wayworth herself, I couldn't help but think how cool Blair would find it all. My heart began to ache at the thought that he and I might never get a chance to sit in this room together, to laugh, to talk, or even be silently close again. Hmm. Miss Wayworth pulled me from my thoughts. You wouldn't happen to know your friend's birthday, now would you? Um, I searched my memory. Y yeah, it's September 28th. Libra, she mumbled. Not good. What do you mean, not good? I asked, standing to my feet. We have a bigger problem on our hands than just an odd acting teen, she said, lying the book out on the table. She held it open to a page showing a circle divided into a pie-like portions, each one marked by some symbol. What kind of problem? I said. What's going on? Let me first start by telling you a little bit about this Medora M., she said, leaning back gracefully in her chair. She was a witch like you and I long ago. She practiced the green arts, felt a great connection to the earthly magics of the wood, so she made her home in the forest. As time passed, she uncovered something out there, something incredibly powerful. I imagine this something wasn't good, I said. You would be correct, she said. She started simply by tapping into this power for normal spells, and before too long, the rules of natural magic felt too constraining to her. She began using the power to her own will, corrupting herself in the process. She even learned how to commune with this ancient power to learn its dark and formidable knowledge. I thought there was no such thing as black magic, I said. Normally that is true, she said, taking another sip from her tea. All magic that is natural is tied to the earth. It is green, it is neutral, it is all hanging in a balance. However, this is something different. What Medora found in those woods is not natural. It is dark, it is black, it is not right. So what's going on? I asked. Medora M. bartered with the darkness, love, she said. She sacrificed someone she truly loved in exchange for power and knowledge to become indestructible. Indestructible? I asked. Like she's immortal? That was her plan, she said, but it never came to be. It would seem that the power came at a great price. She could not harness it within her own body. She would need a body of another. According to this book, she cannot gain her powers until a certain ritual is performed. She leaned forward and read from the book. The act will require thirteen initiates, all of which will invoke the Black Flame, twelve souls that align with the twelve phases of the Zodiac, and the thirteenth to become the vessel. Phases of the Zodiac? I asked. The phases of the Zodiac hold great power, she said. 
When we are born, we align with that phase of the zodiac. I am a Leo, you an Aquarius. Each of these can determine different aspects of our own magical abilities. Put twelve of us together who all align with different phases and merge our powers, then that can be a pretty incredible thing in itself. If all the initiates have invoked the Black Flame, then they all have been touched by a piece of the darkness that Medora M. discovered. They are all changed. They all become compatible for this forbidden magic. Oh, I said. On a night that the moon is full, she continued, the ritual of relocating a soul will be performed. The twelve will surround the thirteenth, and the chant of relocation will be spoken aloud. Once the soul is conjured, and the chant is spoken, the vessel will be ready to house the soul. For the transfer to work, the vessel must be bled by a knife that has been tempered by the dark fire. Bled? I asked, not liking the sound of that. Cut, she said, taking another sip from her tea. Blood must flow from the wound, not a lot, but enough to consider it as an offering. What does any of this have to do with Blair? I asked. More than you know, she said, motioning to the circular drawing on the page. Eleven of the twelve signs are marked off, likely your eleven cultists. The only missing sign is Libra. It was no mere chance that your friend felt so compelled to take the book, compelled, compelled to invoke the black flame after seeing it that night in the woods. As the missing sign, it was likely calling to him without even knowing, and now that the twelfth sign has invoked the black flame himself, the circle is now complete. As much as I hated to admit it, it all made sense. Blair was being drawn by the dark magics of Medora's book. It changed him. It was still changing him. What if this Medora is dead? I asked, grasping for straws. She most likely is, Miss Wayworth said, but I fear it hardly matters. We are talking about dark and unnatural magic here. If the spell is carried out, it will conjure her soul from wherever it resides, living or dead. After the chant is performed, the only way for her soul to return to where it was is if the vessel is not bled in her presence. I hardly need to tell you that this must never happen. If she manifests in the new body, there is no telling what terrible thing she could do. We burn the books, I said. Without the thirteenth initiate to invoke the black flame, we have nothing to worry about. I'm sorry, love. Miss Wayworth gave me a sympathetic smile. You are right, but then again, you are wrong. There is a thirteenth initiate. It's you. Her words hit me like a brick wall. Of course it was me. How could I have forgotten that I was a part of this whole twisted thing? I performed the black flame. I saw the darkness, the black goat in the woods. It looked at me. It beckoned me. Was it telling me that I was the body? You must protect yourself, she said. I have charms that can help, but charms can only go so far. As important as everything she said sounded, I, I wasn't paying much attention. I didn't want to hear about the Black Flame, the soul of Medora M., the ritual of relocation. All I wanted was for all of this to fall away and be forgotten, because despite how important it all was, all I wanted was Blair Everett back. We spoke for a little while longer before I brought myself to leave. On my way out the door, she handed me a book and patted me gently on the back. I'm sorry about your friend, love, she said with a warm smile. There is a chance he may never be the same again, but it is his choice. Understand, he is fighting a difficult battle inside his own head. He must decide to turn from the dark. I hope that he sees what he's missing in you and makes the right choice. Thank you, I said, as I started out the door. One last thing, she said. The only way to destroy a soul is through fire. Fire holds great power over magic and evil. If the ritual begins and her soul gathers, the only way to stop her is through fire. The only way to destroy her soul is to burn it, and it must be done before she enters the vessel. Two nights later, I found myself in my room. There had still been no word from Blair, and 
the things Miss Wayworth had told me were filling my head. Daylight faded into dusk and dusk into darkness, and I just sat in my room mauling over everything. Moonlight trailed in through my window, casting shadows on my wall, reminding me of that first night I stayed with Blair. I was just about to roll over and try to sleep when the phone rang. To my surprise, it was Blair. What do you want? I grumbled. I was just calling to say I'm sorry, Benjamin. He said, I've been a real jackass, and I'm sorry. None of it will happen again. That's what you said before, I replied. I know, he said, but I'm done. I burned the book. I got rid of the damn thing. I feel so much better. I just miss you so much. Really? I felt my heart skip for the first time since we'd been apart. Yes, he said. My parents are out of town, and I thought if you can accept my apology, maybe you could come over and I could make things up to you properly. Okay, I said before even allowing myself to think it over. I'll be right there. Less than an hour later, I found myself standing outside of the Everett house again. It was unusually dark, save but for the orangey glow of flickering candles reflecting in the living room windows. I saw a shadow move in the darkness within and knew it had to be Blair getting things ready for his proper apology to me. I felt a smile tug at the corner of my mouth as I began to make my way toward the door. As I approached, I saw the door was open. The unmistakable silhouette of Blair Everett stood in the doorway. Come in, he said, waving a shadowy hand in my direction, before disappearing into the doorframe. I followed, my heart pounding with anticipation. I made my way into the house where his shadowy figure had beckoned me forward. I couldn't believe I was actually there. Things were actually going back to normal. Through the doorway I went, and into the living room where I found my prize. The candles were casting a faint glow as we stood there, looking eye to eye. Blair Everett had been waiting for me, apparently wanting me just as much as I wanted him. He was standing there, the embodiment of temptation. His dark hair was a mess. The black satin shirt, which he hadn't even bothered buttoning, was draped over his shoulders, framing his thin, lithe chest. He looked at me, a wicked smile forming on his lips. Benjamin. He said, opening his arms. It's so good to see you again. I immediately closed the space between us, wrapping my arms around him in a tight embrace. His body was warm, and I let myself melt into him. You have no idea how much I've wanted this? I said, no louder than a whisper. Oh, but I do. He said as he cupped my face in his hands, as he guided me in for a soft kiss. I pressed myself into him, wanting nothing more than to feel that special magic. Let's go upstairs, I said, biting at his lip. I have another idea, he said with a dangerous smile. It's such a beautiful night. How about we take a walk? After, I said, sliding the shirt off his shoulders. We can walk after. I just need you now. But it's such a beautiful night, he grinned. Can you imagine how it would feel under the stars? Besides, I think it would be amazing to see you wearing nothing but the light of the full moon. In the shadowy glow of the candlelight, I saw his eyes for the first time. They were dark, sickly dark, hungry with something more than desire. Though he looked calm and collected, I could almost see that dark, purplish fire burning in his eyes. His hands slid from my face down to my neck, across my shoulders, stopping once they gripped my arms. What are you doing? I asked. Ben. Benjamin. Benji. He said, holding me still. I want you so damn bad, believe me. I would take you right here and right now if I could, but I can't. From the corner of my eye, I could see a shadow move in the darkness. We were not alone. I know you can feel it, he said, gazing at me with those wild and haunting eyes. I can feel it, the thunder crashing in your heart. Why do you fight it, Ben? Just give in. Embrace the fire that's burning inside you, and we can finally be one, like we used to be. You have no idea what you're talking about, I growled. You're lost without me, he said. Admit it to yourself. You resist the fire. I embrace it. That is the rift between us. I can't live without you, Benjamin. Give in to the fire so our souls can align like they once did. It's the way it has to be. I will never embrace that infernal fire, I said. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Is that so? He said. 
His eyes grew sad, yet still burned with that faintest hint of violet flicker. We'll see about that. The next thing I knew, I felt a great pain crack across the back of my head. Then all went black. My next memory came to me in a blur. My eyes flickered open, and it was so dark that at first I wasn't sure if I'd even opened them at all. Dizziness was swimming through my head, dizziness and pain. My ears were ringing, blocking out any sound that I might have heard. The back of my head was throbbing from whatever had knocked me unconscious. Slowly, the world came fluttering back to me as I began to regain the use of my senses. First came the distinct scent of wood burning, smoke like that of a campfire. I blinked and blinked again as my eyes could begin to make out the faint lines of trees overhead, highlighted by an orange and ambery glow. As the ringing in my head started to fade, I could hear the crackling of the fire and the hushed and muffled voices of people all around me. I tried to move, but it was of no use. At first, I thought I was paralyzed, but as I tried to make my limbs budge, I realized that I had been held down by some kind of restraints. I writhed my hands, realizing that a thick, rough-feeling rope was digging into my wrists. I tried to move my legs and concluded that the same ropes had been used there, too. Realization came flooding back to me. I was laying on a slab of cold stone. Beyond the trees above, the sky shone down on me in a pale shade of midnight blue, painted with twinkling stars. Glowing with its silvery brilliance was the full moon, hanging in the sky like a shimmering ghostly coin. It was the herald of everything that Miss Wayworth had warned me about. As it gazed down at me from the velvety sky, I could almost feel it smiling at me. It was not a sadistic, ironic sort of way, but like the comforting smile of an old friend telling me that everything was okay, telling me to relax, because this is the way it had to be. As I moved my head, I was overcome by an intense pain at the back of my skull. Anger pulsed through me as I realized that I had been betrayed. It all began to make sense. So much sense. Miss Wayworth had warned me to be on my guard on the night that a moon is full, for the servants of the Black Flame would seek to trick me. I just never realized that it would be him, that it would be Blair. He used my weakness for him as bait, and worst of all, I had been stupid enough to fall for the trap. I glanced at the woods around me. Through the smoky screen hanging in the air, I could see the cultists forming a circle around me. Unlike before, there were now twelve hooded figures, all of them faceless in the shadows save but one. Blair Everett stood to my left eyes dark and lifeless, just a pawn in Medora M.'s unnatural scheme. As I glanced around, I could hear the crackling of the fire. I could see its warm glow on the trees, on the black goat skulls glaring down at me, but I couldn't move enough to see the fire itself. It started out in little more than a whisper, voices speaking words I couldn't understand. They grew louder and louder until it was a full-on chant. Despite it being gibberish, I could somehow actually understand the words they were saying. It came from the shadows, it came from the shadows, it binds us to the flame. It came from the shadows, it came from the shadows, it calls out to her name. It came from the shadows, it came from the shadows, it burns away our fear. It came from the shadows, it came from the shadows, we call her spirit here. As the chant continued on, I was overcome by the sudden fear that this was really happening. They were calling the spirit of Medora M. to the ravine. They were performing the ritual of relocation. I was really going to be the vessel to house her soul. I writhed and twisted on the cold stone in a hopeless attempt to free myself. I struggled with every ounce of strength, but the ropes were just too tight. In the space above me, I could see the slight luminescence begin to take shape in the darkness. My hope was beginning to fade as realization came trickling in. This glowing form had to be the spirit of Medora M. She was manifesting before my eyes, and there was nothing in this world that I could do. I could feel the change in my body as the glowing thing just lingered there in the space above me. I was becoming hers. My heart was pounding in my chest as I heard the voices of the cultists cease their chant. The time had come, and there was no place for me to run. One of the twelve had stepped forward, the knife in his hand shimmering with both moonlight and firelight. 
It was a wicked-looking thing with an intent to tear into my flesh, to let my blood flow so that the ritual would be complete. I closed my eyes, preparing for the worst, hoping that it would be as painless as possible. From the darkness behind my closed eyes, I could see the image of that black goat filling my head. It was calling to me, and somehow I was beckoning it forward, out of the void from where it hid. That is when I heard the screams. I opened my eyes to see the silver blade shimmering above me, but to my surprise the man who held it was gazing into the distance in fear. His hand was trembling. The chanting had stopped. Chaos had ensued, and worst of all, I had no idea what was going on. I could see people scattering in all directions, fear stretching across every one of their faces. What is it? I heard one say. The devil! Another shouted, or worse. In my head I could hear a voice. Benjamin, it said. I didn't know how, but it was Blair, speaking to me into my mind. Benjamin, concentrate on the flames. Use your mind to make them glow. We'll burn this fucking place to the ground if we have to. I did as he said. I focused on the fire, channeling all of my fear into that one single place. There was a bright light, and fire exploded into the trees. I watched in horror as the orange glow of the flames leapt from the tree to tree as fire spread throughout the ravine. Suddenly, Blair was at my side. He was untying the ropes, freeing me from the sacrificial stone. It's going to be okay, he assured me as he worked the ropes. We're going to get out of here. I watched as he undid the ropes, my heart fluttering with a nervous anticipation. Had the horror made him see the truth of the darkness? Was my Blair Everett truly back? Just as I was almost free, I saw the form of a young man running up behind him. I caught the glimmer of a knife in his hand, but it was a moment too late. There was a sound I can only equate to that sound when you plunge a knife into a melon or a pumpkin. It was a hollow sound, like a thud, followed by a pained gasp. Blair's eyes were wide and confused as he clutched at his chest, but there was nothing there. "'How dare you defy our god?' the man said. "'The black goat of the woods has appeared, and all you fools do is run away in terror!' At that, the black tentacle reached out from the darkness and pulled the cultist away. I leapt from the stone, pulling Blair toward me. As I wrapped my arms around him, I could feel the knife was gone, and in its place— Warm and sticky blood was flowing down his back. His breathing was labored as he coughed for air. Blair! I shouted. Benjamin! He smiled. My dear friend Benjamin, what a fool I've been. Come on, Blair, I said, dragging him away from the flames. His body was heavy as I tried to guide him through the darkness. We have to get out of here. You have to get out of here, he said. I'm not going to make it. What are you talking about? I asked. You're going to be fine. He looked up at me, his brilliant green eyes clear and free from the influence of that black and purple flame. I could see nothing but Blair Everett staring back at me. No darkness, no tricks, just a sense of peace and contentment. He took my hand and entwined his fingers with mine. You're my best friend, he said with a smile. I don't want you to ever forget that. How could I ever forget that? A knot was forming in my throat. I forgive you, Blair. We'll still do all the stuff we did together like we always did. We have our whole lives ahead of us. I'm sorry for hurting you, he said. His words were forced as he was gasping for air. I'm sorry for everything. I just wish I could have seen it before it was too late. Blair, I said. Benjamin. He put a finger to my lips to hush me. There is one magic that can overcome all forces of darkness, and it is the greatest magic of all. What magic? I asked as tears streamed from my eyes. Love, he smiled. I love you, Benjamin. Our love binds us, now and always. I cannot be with you as we both wished, but no, I'll always be there, in your heart. I'm sorry. I know it's not the way we wanted it, but it is the way it has to be. He sat up and pressed his soft lips to mine. It was a solemn kiss, but I could feel the smile in it all the same. The same smile as the night we had met. The smile that trailed behind all those jokes we shared. The smile in all those silent moments that all he was doing was looking at me. 
that same smile that beckoned me to do things I never thought I'd do. He held me in his arms and I in his as we held on to that moment for eternity. It wasn't long enough. It was never long enough. And before I knew it, I felt his body go limp in my arms. And I knew as much as I knew anything else that my secret love secretly died. My eyes were burning with tears as the night grew quiet around me. I held him for hours, caressing his soft hair as I gazed upon his peaceful face, but he wasn't there. I was alone amidst the forest as the flames of desolation burned that ravine to cinders around me. This has been part six of The Way It Has To Be. If you have enjoyed what you've heard so far, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing, for this story will soon conclude in part seven. <laughs>